friends, and welcome to the World Transformed. This program is your guide to an astounding future that lies ahead, one that will be here sooner than you think, and one that you have an important role to play in bringing about. At the World Transformed, we want to introduce you to what may be the greatest transformation of them all, the one that begins with considering and acting on the almost limitless possibilities that lie before us, and that ends somewhere beyond the reach of the human imagination. So, when does this amazing future begin? Well, today is the day. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-author, co-futurist, and co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. Happy Friday. How are you? I am a super fantastic. Happy Friday right back at you. Looks like we've, got a, we, we've, we've made our way through another week, and we've got a fun show lined up for tonight as well. Absolutely. I'm going to start off with uh, axolotls, right? We take pride in the fact that we can pronounce the word. Get well, you do. I, I always get it wrong. So, yeah, you take that. But <laughs> I, I, I'm always like, how, how do you say this thing? What I take pride in is the fact that this is not our first axolotl story. This is an update, okay? Because <laughs> right. we are right. – folks. We were talking about this creature what, last news. week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We were, and we got we got additional information. They're so interesting. We've got additional information. Just to put this in context, on on Monday we talked a little bit about space and how Glenn Reynolds says, "Hey, people should be more aware of the fact that things are great, and we've got a golden age happening in space." And we took on that idea and we expounded on it. We said, "Not only are things great, this is the best time ever to be alive," as evidenced by the fact that we seem to be curing cancer and curing aging and and doing all kinds of wonderful things, that, that there is real progress being made in taking on some of the biggest challenges that humans face. And we framed it as this, uh, as this wager about when would you rather be alive, and basically we'd rather be alive now or later, right, given the choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in, in order to uh, get Phil to go back in time, I had to offer him, like, uh, you, you're, you're, Neil, <laughs> you're Neil Armstrong on the way to the moon. That's pretty much Yeah, you had, you had me at, at Buzz Aldrin, but then I realized, no, I was going to hold out for Neil. I had to be Neil Armstrong. <laughs> yeah, that's moon. right. Otherwise, I wasn't going right. to take it. And, and now tonight we've got, a few more, we got a, just a few more things that kind of help back that up, back up. This is more of a – didn't I say recently that every show is pretty much us going, see, we told you it was going to be like this, right? And I think that's what we're doing here tonight. <laughs> Basically, this is – see, here's more proof that the world is really getting awesome. So the axolotl. What's the what's the main distinguishing characteristic of this creature? It says here that it's a smiling animal, and it is an interesting looking <laughs> smiling animal. It looks like a like it like it stays a baby its whole life. Yeah, the defining characteristic of in, most amphibians or amphibians as a group is that they they start their lives as tadpole type creatures in the water, and then they have a and then they go on to land uh, at least for part of their life uh, as adults. But not this creature. It's like a tadpole its entire life. Uh, it stays a tadpole, but, and, and apparently that keeps it well uh, just flush with the, what, what am I going to say, embryonic-type stem cells. It stays, it, uh, it stays embryonic. So it, because it can, it can regrow uh, lots of different parts of its body completely. It's an, it's an amazing yeah, and, creature. And, and that's really the distinguishing characteristic I was looking for. You know, you think about a salamander, and its tail comes off, and then it regrows a tail. And you hear about some creatures that it can lose a limb and it will regrow a limb. This thing regrows organs, okay? It doesn't scar. If you cut it, which is mean, don't do that, but uh, it does not scar if you put a big gash in it. It just all, it all heals back. You take a limb off, it grows the whole limb back, bone, muscle, the whole thing. You damage its internal organs, it regrows those internal organs. It appears to have an almost unlimited regenerative capacity that is the that is the amazing thing about the axolotl and its genome has just been sequenced we talked about that a couple weeks ago and how that's that, that's really exciting because potentially somewhere in that genome is the key to how you regenerate like this and if you could do that well we got an update on this right so number one <laughs> well, we, uh don't if if uh, if any of us are getting uh, you know have an ego problem because you know the large size of our genomes, 
<laughs> we need to get over we need to, yeah yeah get over yeah. ourselves because uh the axolotl has it's like how how much bigger is it than the than the human genome it's 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 insane it's like a 10 it's times outrageous they, they have 32 yeah. billion base pairs okay so they're yeah. i don't know it's like an order of magnitude bigger than ours i mean it's just yeah. huge compared to ours. That's, that's mathematically what I just said is probably wrong, but it's a lot bigger. Okay. And I'm not looking at the number right now. It's a lot bigger. So somebody's going to send me an email and tell me that I'm an idiot, but it's, it's much, much bigger than the human genome. And apparently there's a couple of reasons for that. One is there's just a lot of redundant information in there, but it could be that all that redundant information and the way it is sequenced might have something to do with their regenerative capability. And the other piece that we've learned is that we've now spotted what some of the regeneration genes are, okay? So two big, two big things about the axolotl that have both occurred just since we did the initial axolotl story. One is, turns out, th this wasn't part of the story that we, that, that we reported initially, and I thought it's, worth, it's definitely worth talking about. They've got a huge genome, lots of information in there, and now it looks like we're pinpointing the pieces that, that seem to drive the regenerative capability. So if we're, if we're going to see any benefit for humans out of what we know about axolotls, uh, that might come sooner rather than later because we, be, we seem to be making some pretty significant progress with our, with our understanding of these guys, don't we? Absolutely. And I believe, Phil, that these guys are in danger, too. So it's an object lesson, and uh, let's take care of our environment, right? We do not want to... Absolutely. We do not want to, uh, want to uh, drive into extinction some, uh, some animal that could tell us as much as the axolotl can. And as far as the world knows, uh, the only axolotls left are those that are in the labs. And so, yeah. Jerry, take care of those little guys, and, and maybe one day we can get them back out in the... Uh, and in the environment again. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to be driving animals to extinction anyway. But this is a, this right. is a shining reason on why it's a bad idea to let animals go extinct until we, you know, that we, that we know nothing about. Here, here are these almost magical creatures that we could have driven extinct before we ever even began to understand how amazing they really are. And there's probably some other species out there that have a lot to teach us too. So, yeah, let's, let's go easy. Let's go easy on the environment. And it is kind of sad to think there's these amazing creatures, and the only ones that exist are in captivity, basically being experimented on, right? It's, it's right. Like, right. Un, it's unfortunate. It would be nice if, uh, if, if uh, they could be reintroduced. I, I suspect because of their water nature that they, 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 uh, they might be susceptible to water pollution in their native yeah. uh, Mexico. So, uh, you know, need to have some pristine water for them and, uh, and back in their – back in their normal environment, maybe that can be reintroduced. That would be great. Let's bring back the axolotl. Absolutely. All right, so yeah. our next story, researchers create first stem cells using CRISPR genome activation. This is cool because it's, a, it's an update on things, a couple of threads we've talked about in the past. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about CRISPR over the last few years, uh, particularly the last couple of years, and particularly the last year, I guess, really, talking about interesting new therapies, exciting new therapies that are going to be the result of our ability to manipulate the genetic code. That's what CRISPR lets us do. Creating stem cells, well, that's been done in the lab for the last decade. I, I think actually they talk here about research that was done 12 years ago. And we talked about it. We talked about it in our blog, and we've talked about it since then on this podcast. Japanese scientist uh, Shinya Yamanaka did an experiment in which he was able to take skin cells from the hand, I believe, and turn those back into pluripotent embryonic stem cells. It was uh, one, first of its kind research back in the day, and it's been replicated numerous times since then. And this was done by, I believe, using proteins. He was introducing proteins into the cells and it was a pretty complicated process of making it happen. And what we're seeing happen now is just a, an improved methodology for doing that. If you want to take skin cells and turn them into stem cells, it turns out CRISPR can make that happen just at the snap of a finger, right? It, that it, it's a very straightforward process. And, of course, going back to the previous couple of stories about the axolotl, we know that stem cells are 
probably critical to that regenerative capability that those creatures have. The ability to produce new stem cells has got to have something to do with the ability to grow a new limb or to regrow an internal organ. And our ability to create those using CRISPR, I think, speaks very in a very positive way for all kinds of treatments, for heart disease, for cancer, for just... Uh, prob- there's probably some, uh, a lot of anti-aging applications for that as well. Absolutely. Well, think of this, Phil. As we get older, we uh, our pool of adult stem cells in our bodies diminishes over time. I mean, what if, uh, what if we could just replenish that, right? Uh, so that when you know we we look you know look and see, hey, this person has a you know low amount of adult stem cells. It's going to be a little difficult for their body to heal or you know, get over illness or whatever. So uh, let's uh, just, uh, you know, for when you do need it, let's replenish that pool a little bit and uh, your body will go to that pool when, when necessary. So that's, uh, that, that may turn out to be some sort of kind of almost a wellness here that uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to take care of this problem before it is a problem. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that they use skin cells here because I think one of the killer apps for stem cells is going to be cosmetics. You know, people use Botox to make their skin look younger, which is this crazy thing because you're actually killing part of your skin to do it, right? You're, you're injecting this, essentially this poison into your skin and killing, some of, killing the nerves or something to, to, take the, to take the wrinkles out. Wouldn't another way to take the wrinkles out be to just put completely young skin in place? I mean, we were talking about how the axolotl doesn't <laughs> scar. Um, I, I think there must be some application down the road. Somebody's going to figure out a way to do this to replace like older, tougher, wrinkly skin with just completely fresh young skin, right? That's not blemished, that's not wrinkled, and that's going to be worth a lot. That that would drive an awful lot of I don't know research dollars. I suspect dollars back that into- uh, our, I suspect our skin gets wrinkled and our hair gets white mm-hmm. due to uh, accumulation of mutations over time. If there's something that can be done so that we replenish the supply, basically, of, of young cells that your body can draw on, so, yeah, the, the wrinkles are fading. Uh, your, hair is not, your hair is no longer white. That, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, before we leave this one, I just, I just want to mention that the story, if you follow the link and read the story, it also mentions, in addition to CRISPR, a third way that they've come up with for generating stem cells. So I think as important as stem cells are, not only for cosmetics and those kinds of treatments, but probably just for treating people who've been injured. You think about uh, paralysis and and some of those kinds of, some of those kinds of conditions, Uh, obviously treatments for burn victims and some of that kind of stuff. Stem cell therapies are going to be huge for so many different things that we're not even mentioning. And this goes back to what we were talking about on Monday's show and what we've touched on again here tonight, which is not just that progress is occurring, but that it's occurring in multiple dimensions all the time. There's several companies trying to launch rockets into space, right? There are several labs out there trying to address questions of how we treat aging and doing interesting experiments on mice. And now it turns out there's several different ways of taking mature cells and turning them into stem cells. The fact that all of these options exist, it, it, well, it kind of puts me in mind of the old analogy you used to make about Spock's chessboard. Yes, and, and uh, in, on Spock's chessboard. Okay, so I guess in order to explain that analogy, Phil, I got, we've got to explain the actual chessboard analogy where you know, things are happening exponentially from one space to the next on a normal chessboard, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, ch- chess boards are used as a is a good example of exponentials. If uh, the, the old old story is about the inventor of chess, who the the emperor was going to reward him for his efforts, and he said, "Here, all I want is give me a grain of rice on the first square of the chess board, then double it, make it two on the next square, make it four on the one after that, and just double until you've finished out the the chess board." And of course, because of exponential increase they pretty quickly clear out the royal granaries and there's no grain left in the kingdom they, and they've only gotten about halfway through the board, right? So that's exponential. So chess, a chessboard is a symbol for things happening exponentially. But that wasn't good enough for Stephen Gordon and he came up with, a, with, with another <laughs> model. I, I, I said, you know what? We got, we got Spock's chessboard because we're doing things and <laughs> it's not just one chessboard that we're seeing exponential development. We're seeing it right. uh, on multiple And we should explain that too. Time. Okay, so in Star Trek... 
the Vulcans played this 3D version of chess, right, where the, there were the, uh, a, a three-leveled chessboard. So just for, for those who don't immediately know what we mean when we say Spock's chessboard, I guess. Yes, I should say 3D chess is what we're talking about. So we've got multiple yeah. platforms that uh, we're seeing exponential development on. So it's, yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty exciting. And the redundancy is, is, is what makes it exciting. You know, let's say that we're wrong to be excited about 90% of the things we talk about, Phil. Because you know none of it pan, and you know ninety percent of the stuff doesn't pan out. You know what? I'm still excited. Ten percent will. You know, absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, so the, the chances the chances that any of the ten percent will will pan out, I think, are fantastic. It doesn't it doesn't right. all have to pan out. And and the thing is, if you've got three ways of generating stem cells, probably one of them will prove to be the most advantageous for most applications and that it will become right. the standard. But the fact that there are multiple approaches just goes to show you that it's a solvable problem and that at this point we're talking about how do we best do it rather than can we do it. And that's pretty amazing. That, that, that's, a, that's a nice nice jump to have made. Okay, we're going we're gonna to get to geek out here in a moment, but I think we've got one more story. And this is an interesting one. Google is using 46 billion data points to predict the medical outcomes of hospital patients. Now, this sounds like kind of a downer when you look at it, but but basically, we're talking about some some highly sophisticated statistical analysis of patient data, and they can tell just at the time you check in what's going to happen to you, which is kind of scary when you think about pr- predictive yeah. analytics. Here you are, you're this age, you've had this happen to you, you got this symptoms. They know if you're going to die, basically. I mean, the the model will tell if if you're going to die. So that sounds very negative, and it sounds very scary. But there's a lot more, I think, to this than, well, than it's, just that. Think about it this way, Phil. It's a lot of times doctors do not know where to put their time, right? Right, right. You've got some kid that's complaining of abdominal pain, okay, but uh, i got this other, other person that's actively bleeding over here. Well, it turns out the abdominal pain kid needed attention that minute because he has a ruptured appendix, right? And uh, the analytics would have told him that. That he that's where he needed to be putting his attention and you know uh, have the nurses put pressure on this one guy. I'm gonna, I'm, I've got to deal with this this kid right now because he's about to die. And I, maybe he wouldn't have not known that without uh, without this without this analytics. I, I see this as a completely not scary at all. But we want intelligence for the medical community. We want more a- analytics like this so that they can. I think so too. Can, uh, spend their time where they need to. In fact, when I read this, I thought, well, what this is, is this is the next iteration of triage. Triage is the idea of you're going to deal with the patients that the resources will allow you to deal with who need it the most first, right? It's a, it's a set of parameters developed in wartime where sometimes you can't help a guy at all on the battlefield, right? You just give him some morphine and it's, it's too late. There's not much you can do for him. But Others, it's like it's critical, but they can be saved, so you give them the attention first. And, and another group, they definitely need attention, but they can wait a while, right? So tr- triage was always right. this idea of who do you treat when and what treatment do you apply? Well, machine learning, this, this, this kind of advanced predictive analytics can give you a whole new dimension on that. And I think, I think what you said is exactly right. A lot of these outcomes where because they present these symptoms, we know they're going to die – is it because they're certain to die, or is it because being checked into the normal procedure guarantees that? Yeah, right? yeah. Could a quarter in, of them in, be in saved? The example I gave, uh, then you, you save both of those patients, both the, right. the guy that's actively bleeding and the kid, because you go to the kid first and deal with that, and then you come back to the guy. Often, they, you just get on the phone and call in more doctors if you need to. You've got to know that you've got the problem. And, and the more tools you have to help you understand what, you know, what, you're, what you're confronted with, the better, as far as I'm concerned. So and this I've is, actually got a geek me, out that sort of speaks to that. Uh, okay, well, b- before you go there, I want, I, want to say, I want to say one more thing about, uh, about why I think this is important, and it's that we have those data points for people checking into a hospital, but ultimately we have a lot of data points about ourselves anyway, and we use that one crisis moment to say we know what the, we know what the outcome is. We've got this whole quantified self movement going on now where people are tracking data about themselves and recognizing their outcomes. I think if you take that 
checking into the hospital and back it up to earlier portions of our lives, you know, when we're not in crisis. If you had a model that showed, you know what, if you keep eating that breakfast every day, you've got a 30% chance of making it another year or whatever it would be, right? The, the, the statistics can show that people who engage in the behaviors you engage in, here's what happens, right? 90% of the time they're dead in five years or something like that. I think it can really make a difference in, in a lot of lifestyle yeah, choices it, and stuff like that. It, it kind of guides you to some better choices, right? I mean, and, Absolutely. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes these things are obvious, you know, uh, if you're smoking, you probably should stop that. <laughs> that's that's that seems like a no-brainer, but you know, uh, if, if uh, but if uh, but there may be some things that we're not quite aware of that uh, you know we need to alter our diets just a little bit to you know uh, for different for uh, to bring in different uh, vitamins you know, and nutrients and things like that. And uh, maybe we maybe we don't know, uh, and uh, and we can use a little guidance. So yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely. I, I think. I think the more data, the better, and the, and, and yeah. the more accurate the predictive models, the better off we are. Even if they even if they tell us some things we don't want to hear, that's okay, because the the only way we can avoid the bad outcomes or mitigate them is to know they're coming and to have as as good right. information on them as we can. But anyway, you were about to you were about to geek us out on this very subject. So yeah, on away. this very thing. Do you remember the television show The Dead Zone, Bill? Sure, Stephen King novel, and yep. then a movie, and then a TV show. Yes, that's right. The TV show. There was a particular episode, and I, I, when I saw this story, and I was reminded of this episode, I went and looked it up. It's episode nine of season one, and it's called The Siege. And in this in this show, a guy that's kind of you know done wrong by the uh, by a, a bank, right? He's you know being go or whatever. He, he decides to take a bunch of people hostage. And uh, so Johnny enters the bank. He's the, he's the main guy. He's the guy that uh, can see what the future is, right? That's, that's right. What, his, what his power is, you know. And throughout the entire show, when something is about to happen, he can, he can see what the outcome of that is. And right. it's almost invariably negative. Oh, oh crap! If we go down this road, the, the bad guys can be dead with about four other people, and uh, and he he kept he kept um, playing it, you know, and doing and, and avoiding those bad outcomes by trying something different from uh, what was about to happen at the time he had his vision of the future. Right. So it's a little bit like that. It's the sort of the God's eye view of things that this, this analytics perhaps, perhaps can give us. So we go, you know what? We won't go down that road. We can, yeah, we can avoid the bad outcome uh, because we, we know enough to know that if we continue in this direction, it's not going to be good. So. And, and especially when there are several potential bad outcomes, it just becomes all the more yeah. important that you keep navigating, right, that you, that you have some means of measuring what that narrow, crooked path that actually gets you where you want to be might be. Because there, statistically, there is probably a best path. Actually, there has to be, right? There has to be one path that has better outcomes than any of the others, even if that one's not great. Right? So, so no, no matter what, you're, you're better off, I, I, I mean, even in the show, not to spoil the end, but he was better off being able to see what was going to happen because eventually, I bet, he finds, he finds a way out of it. Not to spoil a show I never saw, but I, you know, I, I just have this feeling. Call <laughs> yeah. it a, but it call it an a episodic TV show, so I don't guess yeah. you're spoiling that. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't episode. He was yeah. alive for episode ten. Exactly. That's right. All right. Well, yeah. wh while we're geeking out, let's carry on. I think we've got we've got one major geek out story here that that you shared, and this is on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. We've talked a few times, I think, over the years about the Voynich manuscript, and there have been quote-unquote, solutions to it offered here and there. Mysterious manuscript from no one's quite sure when. The, the, the existing piece of it is, is about, I think, 300 years old. It's written in a script that's hard to decipher. It's got strange pictures all through it. It's colorful. It's beautiful. Interesting-looking thing. But it seems to make absolutely no sense whatsoever and yeah. has driven, driven it's people It's a to, huge, heavy thing. It's uh, 240 pages. Uh, still existing. There's some pages that are missing. I can see that. But uh, there's 240 pages in this thing, and it's all on leather, right? It's on tanned leather pages. And so you can imagine how big of a, and heavy of a book we're talking about. Right. And, and, and th theories of its, uh, of its origins are, 
everything from well, it's just a, it's just a hoax to no, it's deliberate gibberish because somebody back in the day wanted to own a book, and you could do that back then. You could just have a scribe write a bunch of gibberish, and at least they'd have a book there in their library, so it would look nice. To my personal pet theory, which is that it's a it's an artifact from a parallel universe, right, where that language does make <laughs> sense, and those pictures look like look like something that. Uh, that, that you know correspond to the natural world in in that world to lots of other theories i mean there have been there have been no limit to the theories, but it's been declared uh, at times completely unsolvable and now this story is yeah. saying not so fast right not so fast i mean it was uh, unsolvable to the world war, world war ii uh code breakers they tried it as sort of a a puzzle to work on while they were trying to break the codes of the nazis and uh, they, they were never able to solve it. And like you say, Phil, over the last 10 years or so, there have been some, uh, there's been some advances. And so, um, but they still didn't have, you know, anything really of substantial. So what they did was they uh, put AI to work on this thing. And the first thing they put the AI to work on was what language is this in? Right. And uh, th- they went into it with the, uh, with the assumption that it was probably uh, a form of Arabic. Arabic, and uh, they were wrong. It turns out it was Hebrew. And uh, to a high degree of probability, it turned out to be Hebrew. And so they go, okay, uh, that's helpful to know what language this is a, an, an encoding of. And uh, then they put the, uh, the AI again to work um, to, d- to determine what, what sort of cipher they were dealing with. And they, they thought that there was previous researchers who thought that it might be an alphagram. In other words, that's when you take the, uh, the, the letters in every single word and put those letters in alphabetical order. And, oh, uh-huh. since, this was a giz- and since this was a Gizmodo article, the, uh, the author, Cory Doctorow, by the way, uh, said, you know, that, that'd be if, uh, Gizmodo would be spelled D-G-I-M-O-O-Z in that cipher because it's in alphabetical order that way right right. and so okay. they they armed with that knowledge they went back to it and uh it, they began to uh see some real progress and uh they, they they got they got something that was beginning to make sense and then they they lastly used google translate to put those words in the proper order for english because uh, hebrew has you know they put their words in different orders uh for to make a sentence so that that final polish from Google Translate helped a lot, and it, it still is an odd way to open up the book. The this first sentence of this book apparently is, "She made recommendations to the priest, the man of the house, and me and the people." <laughs> so, you know, what, rate, you know, it'd be the weirdest thing of all, is if it if that's literally what it says, okay, and it turns out it is just this heavily encoded. Hebrew gibberish, right? It still doesn't mean yeah. anything, right? Even, even when you <laughs> well, you know, they, in the last couple of years, it's it's basically been uh, determined, or at least most of the experts in this document have decided that it it's like a it's a women's health manual. <laughs> Everything they knew about how to take care of uh, a woman's body. Well, I suspect some doctor, you know, way back in the early Middle Ages. This respected but elderly midwife, and he he wants to get he wants to get all of her information before she dies, right. uh, you know, and uh, and so yeah, he starts off the book. It's just it's just for his own benefit, so he doesn't care how it's written. And he's uh, first sentence says, "Well, she made these recommendations to the priest, the man of the house, and me, and and everybody else." And so here here we go. And, uh, and so and he knew who she Steven, was. You made she sense of the, the first the, line. Yeah, she, yeah that, he knew who she was. She was this great midwife, right? And uh, so maybe it was something like that. And uh, so at any rate, it's, it's odd, but you know what? We weren't expecting anything that was normal. Uh, we, we, we should have expected odd, not. right? No, we're expecting <laughs> odd. Well, I'll need to see more yeah. of the text and see if you can make sense of more of the text, because I was, I was reading complete gibberish there. But there, you turned that into a coherent sentence and even put it in context. So it's interesting to think if that's what it is, why would you go to all the trouble to so deeply encode such a banal text, right? Keeping in mind, this was back in the days when, you know, if you wanted to learn something, you'd go apprentice for somebody, right? Right. And a language right. was hidden. You know, you, 
if if you wanted to be a mason uh, and and lay bricks, there was you go apprentice with them, and they they try to hide their techniques for making arches and things like, like that, right? So that hmm. they, they would be special in that. But, you know, I think you, you you're dealing with a doctor here who, uh, who who wanted to be the world's best and 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 he didn't want to share this information with anybody else. So he encoded right. it so that he would have it. And no one else could get it. Not a very likable person, this guy behind the Voynich manuscript, if that's the story. But anyway, <laughs> it's it's the it's the most it's the closest we've gotten to an actual explanation. So we'll have to we'll have to stay tuned and as they keep as they keep reading it and see if you see if that if that explanation actually does pan out. Yep. Fun stuff. All right. Well, Stephen, it's been a great week. Have enjoyed talking with you. We've covered an awful lot of ground. And I'll tell you what, let's come back and do it again next week. We've got three brand new shows to do then. It's been great having you all with us, and we look forward to being with you all again. And until next time, live to see it. Mm-hmm.